I'm Mark Unger, producer of Roundtable. Because we find this presentation so special, we really would like for you to see this. Please watch. Good evening, and welcome to a single shot show at Manhattan Neighborhood Networks Roundtable. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, two major components of photography, about its narrative and its visual part. Um, the uh, photography consists of its aesthetical value and of its uh, chronological, historical value. And uh, in order to discuss it, we invited a brilliant photographer and a journalist of New York Times for many years, Angel Franco. Hello, Angel. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, it's nice uh, to be here. It's very I nice to have you. I don't know about brilliant, <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you. It is my opinion, but I do stand behind <laughs> it. <laughs> thank you. Oh, uh, your work is uh, definitely something that has uh, value in terms of uh, its uh, narrative content, but uh, it's also a visual poetry uh, in some way. So uh, let's try to see which part uh, of this uh, mix is more important and how it works together. What actually creates the shot that gets this timeless properties, probably both of them in a way. I think what in my case helped uh, create that vision was that my father died at a very young age. Uh, or in and I was very young myself, and I spent a lot of time around women. And I picked up a, a way of observing that I don't think if my dad was around, I would have learned. Mm -hmm. um, and it was here, and when I went back to Puerto Rico, it was the same thing there. It was these women, you know. And I'm going to be 68. I go visit these women from my fa father's side, uh -huh. and it becomes the same thing again. I'm, I'm surrounded by that. And it made me aware of space, you know, the relationship of how people put their figurines, the music, right, the smells. And I try to incorporate that when, I, when I'm working. So basically, uh, your inspiration comes from uh aesthetical uh, signals you see around yourself. Yes. Um, I don't... I used to get yelled at a lot as, as a young boy because I was the wrong person to send to the store because I would pick up whatever it was and I'd be looking at ceilings and storefronts and buildings and, you know, and I still do that. And I'm lucky I'm married to someone who does it too, so we have these great conversations at the end. but. You know, I explore everything. I listen to the rhythm. You know, I listen to the music that's rolling around the street, how people walk. I try to figure out that rhythm, what music, you know. And when I'm working on a long story for the times, I would call up the music. I didn't have to go to the music library to look it up and listen to it. I could do it on Google. And on Google, I can hear the difference. I mean, like, I went to shoot the Hasidim community, all right? And Brothers walk fast. Well, I listened to their music, and it was this, pr I probably mispronouncing it, but it was this klezmer music. Once I heard their music, I said, oh, okay. So I got the rhythm to that, you know? And using these likers also a lot permits me to, in, uh, you know, watch that rhythm and that pattern and help design that movement. Well, that's a uh, true unique uh, outlook at uh, photography in terms of uh, how it uh, being created, but what you're describing is actually a progression. It's something that uh, doesn't seem to be inseparable. So what would be then uh, this particular moment when uh, you decided that you need to take this one note and turn it into som something timeless? Photograph in this case. Well, I, I, I make a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, but, but nowadays I can, you know, feel when that's, that's, that movement and that feeling is coming across, you know. Um, but 
I'm one of those uh, photographers that shoots a lot. Um, you know, people, I mean, my first week at the Times, they used to call me Cecil B. DeMille, because, you know, the old timers would come in with one roll of film and two jobs, and I'd come in with 10 rolls of film on one job. And it's like, I said, yeah, but I explored. I mean, you let me into your life, and I'm going up and down your building, and do I'm not going to stand you up against the wall and do two frames and say thank you, you know? You're sharing that moment of your existence. I want to be able to share my existence with that, and let's see what kind of visual vocabulary we end up with. And that happened. But the other thing is, when I was a young guy, I, I was part of the Ben Fernandez photo film workshop. Uh -huh. And uh, Ben had this workshop, and it was all student teach student. And I couldn't read or write because of, you know, uh, uh, classified retarded by the state. And I was in special classes, so no one taught us how to read. But I always wanted to take pictures. And Ben, you know, um, kind of like encouraged that. It turned out he, ha he had the same problem, mm -hmm. you know. But the difference was that we had special characters come in, you know. Um, w. Gene Smith would come in and have these conversations, and I ended up, you know, cleaning his law space and having these long conversations with him. And I was a kid, I, you know, and then we would go to these meetings that they used to have at a steakhouse downtown, and they were all your heroes of, you know, all the history was right there. And they, all of them would sit there and talk to you about your pictures. You, if you were invited, you had to bring pictures, and they would discuss the work and all this stuff. It was just amazing, and it was free. Oh. Yeah. So do you remember any of the advices you got from this? Uh, Cortez was always saying, you got to watch edges. So he would do this, like, chopping thing, you know? Um, S Smith would tell you great stories, but he would play great music, you know? And Little did I know that I was wiping, you know, <laughs> dust off history and whatnot. But, it, but you know, wiping that dust off, I picked up a lot of ways of composing and, and designing. Well, basically, watching the edges is uh, the caterpillar of uh, framing the image properly. And especially for photojournalism, is probably the most important part of taking the right shot. Well, you can be wrong with lighting, you can be wrong with anything, but your framing have to be impeccable. Well, I, I teach, uh, uh, I've been teaching some classes and I tell the, the, the photographers, because I don't call them students, they're photographers, and we're all photographers, and we're going to share the ex our experiences as photographers together. Mm -hmm. The only difference is I'm older, that I photograph from the edges, right? And I design everything within to the center or off center or whatever they call the roots of thirds. I don't believe in that stuff. But, you know, then my photographs are read from here out. And I'm still doing that and I can do it with almost any format camera, you know. And um, it took a lot of time, but I had an interesting class in uh, the School of Visual Arts. It was two dimensional design, right? Mm -hmm. And it was great. I thought we were going to be in the classroom, we weren't. This teacher was so wild, he built L's <laughs> and put them on, on, uh, on uh, rollers, wheels. Uh -huh. And we would go from 23rd Street all the way up to 30-something Street, designing the street <laughs> and cutting. He was teaching us how our eyes, right, could see two-dimensional, right? Yes. And, 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 he, and it did. And then when I started using Leica's, Hey, <laughs> it all just came together. So, um, but y I've been able and lucky to have experiences with amazing people that really, really cared and loved photography. And it was free, you know? Photographers would talk to you, and I, I'm still doing that. I'm mentoring a bunch of people. They come up and they say, hey, and come on in. What do you charge? I said, hey, look, the guy who taught me didn't charge. All right, so sit down. I'll tell you when we'll, you know, I, I need to go and do some work. Well, uh, this approach surely not that common anymore, especially since uh, the amount of photographers in the world growing every day by some crazy numbers. I think they already lost count a long time ago. Well, you so know, that's what happens when you build a camera with, with a P on it, a program, oh. you know. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, speaking of that, a lot, there's a lot of schools that are doing away with their darkrooms, and that's sad because 
if you're really interested in photography, shoot film, right? And people will disagree, oh, it's expensive. Yes, but you're not chimping. You're not looking at the camera. I'm photographing. I never look at that screen. That screen is off, you know? Um, it's not about that. It's not about losing my, my, my rhythm, you know? And a lot of photographers don't realize it's that rhythm. So I have my students, or as I call them, not students, but, you know, my buddies, really. And they come around, and we go. We even walk together sometimes, you know, because I have the knack to stop people in the street, talk to them. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Oh, well, I'm scared, man. I'm a big Puerto Rican guy. You, you know, a lot of people are intimidated. But I say, hey, that's their problem. I'm going to get to know them. So we do that. It, and it came in handy in my career at the New York Times because I was able to use, you know, as I call it, all that Puerto Rican hugging and dancing. You know, we were able to just, you know, put it to use. And um, it's... Hello, this is Alex A.G. from uh, Single Shot with another single trick. Tonight I want to tell you a little bit about post-production. There is one feature in uh, Photoshop and many other photo editing programs that being used uh, scarcely. That's channels. And uh, there is only one reason why it is so. Nobody understands what it is for. Well, not nobody, but a lot of people don't. So when you see an image just like this, uh, you are getting in channel that. And that's very counterintuitive because you actually supposed to be seeing this. Three separate sets of color, not of grayscale. So if you would think of each channel as specific color, for example, of red being red instead of grays, blue being blue instead of uh, grays, and green likewise, you'll uh, find channels very useful for editing. street and just starting the conversation with them and uh, that's actually indeed a very important skill for any photographer and especially when it comes to journalistic photography because people are wary of the cameras more than they used to. Well, have you taken a, a, a sociology class? I actually did, yes. Yeah, and they teach you about certain groups and circles of encroachment and um, and I would when I took the class, I say, circles of encroachment. I, I don't think we have one because w when we dance, we're moving and violating every circle, right? But never bumping into anyone, mm -hmm. right? And that's become a valuable piece for me because I, as a big guy, I can weave in and out of places and people in between. But sometimes people say, wow, you really moved through there and didn't see it. The other thing is, you scan the street, you know? And like if I was doing those um, drug stories or murder stories, I would scan the street. And I would pick up from the way people are walking and interacting, who was the person in charge and how that person was being protected, you know? So now I know how to violate that space with kindness and being polite. Oh, that's actually incredible skill which I never mastered myself. If I'm photographing on the street, I'm trying to have a long, a pretty long lens. Oh, uh, yeah. my long lens is the 50 and the 75. I shoot everything 28, 21. Oh. But I'm learning how to shoot uh, with these uh, pro photo strobes 
with a Leica and a 50. Uh -huh. I'm doing some portraits, so I'm, I'm seeing how that works. Because I'm going away. I'm going away for almost uh, three months. I'll be working in Puerto Rico and uh, uh, you know, self assigned uh, stuff. As you mentioned to me, you're actually planning to have some exciting projects. I hope down so. There. And I've been working the border. Uh -huh. um, I didn't uh, bring any of that work because it's uh, the more I look at it, it's like, wow. <laughs> there aren't any people involved uh -huh. so far. Okay, I'm just following that line, you know, and how it turns and how the light, the clouds, and nature interact with it, you know. With uh, the southern border of the United States. Uh, yes, the, uh, uh, the U.S.-Mexican border. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and my wife and I have been working on that together, so that's been a lot of fun. Retirement's been really great that way. We spend a lot of good time doing this stuff. And now when uh, w we head to Puerto Rico to uh, work on hopefully some very interesting stuff, still researching. Um, but I, you know, I have family, friends, and all that other stuff, so, uh, but they think I'm strange because, you know, what, you take pictures, tell stories, and, and so, yeah. <laughs> oh, we would have spoiled the fun, uh, and yet see this uh, works when they would be created. So let's talk about something that you actually already created and uh, on what you have serious. You was mentioning before that uh, scanning of the street and actually seeing people, right. which reminds me of uh, one of my personally favorite series, The Invisible New Yorker, so let's talk about <laughs> that. That's quite a remarkable collection of work and a uh, very interesting concept. Thank you. Th and that was done after work, right? Or if I had a, a late assignment, I would shoot in the morning, and that was walking the streets with a big eight and a half by 11 drawing book, black tape, uh, Polaroid film back then, uh -huh. and uh, Hasselblad SWC, and no tripod. <laughs> well, I rarely use tripod myself, yeah, so yes. I can definitely relate to that. And, you know, I mean, I'm talking to people. Yeah, say, so, hey, um, and ended up doing, I found a friend of mine that I went to junior high school with who was in the intelligent classes, and I was down on the first floor, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and he was homeless and living with a woman in the streets, and she called herself Angel. And you know, I sat there and I had a long conversation with this guy. Wow. So, so I did a portrait of him and his girlfriend. Um, and then the Lens blog ran uh, The Invisible New Yorkers, and mm -hmm. they ended up getting an apartment. So it was kind of nice to uh, uh, pull out of the street. But at the same time, I met. Uh, a, a guy who played Jesus on Easter, mm -hmm. right? Um, this Dominican man, and who was very serious about it and carried that cross, and then they took him into Cretona Park on these rocks, and behind him, it's like an empty Bronx, but these rocks. And I said, wow, this is <laughs> whoever wrote this, uh, this is almost the same uh, uh, deal. The yeah. only thing is a lot of rocks and no sand. Oh, I can reassure you that actually just being on a cross even without hands being pierced is very trying physically. It is. But the funny part is that I have people tell me what, what's, you know, w why did you do that? You know, what is it that causes you to do these things? What I what's your secret? You know, you, what are the, the, those desires that you have? And this is a conversation I would have. Huh? You know, all right, so... I have to make deliveries all day to pay my bills. What do I do after that? You ever bother asking someone that's, you know, oh man, <laughs> I met one guy, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. And he took my book and he wrote this whole thing about the pharaohs and whatnot. And, you know, I ran into uh, a gentleman in Staten Island, a little old guy, right? Guido, Are you Italian? No, Hungarian. We start talking. Turns out this man, right, rescued a little girl, right, during the war. And he had a sister that had passed away that looked, resembled this little girl. The family had to flee. And after the war, family came back and got the daughter. And that was it. Handshake, thank you, right? Many years later, he wrote a book. The woman is in Hungary. She picks up this book. She goes, oh, my God. It's my story. 
<laughs> and they got together and, you know, and uh, I mean, little things like that. One guy um, in, uh, in El Barrio on 116th Street, I'm talking to him because I wanted to shoot people flying birds. And so I went to the bird store and they said, yeah, there's a guy right here. He's the super. It's this little skinny little guy that fit through that. <laughs> I had to really struggle to go up that ladder and fit through that little opening to get onto that flat roof. And he had a bird coop with these little birds, and he fed them and all these other things. And, and he grabs and holds the birds uh, like they were his children, you know? And it was like, what do you do that? Oh, because, you know, I feel good. You know, it's important to save these lives and all this other stuff. And I'm like, wow. I met one other guy that I didn't get to photograph. And we were talking. I go, wait, why do you fly birds? And he I wanted to get a picture of, but then the city uh, moved his birdhouse. Uh -huh. He said, when I was incarcerated, the birds would land on the window, right, uh, the bars. And he said, if I'm ever right, released from this place, I will fly birds, and there will be no door in the coop. I mean, it was <laughs> so you meet it's philosophers uh, during this thing. Um, I mean, hundreds of stories. Then I ended up becoming the Disland photographer, mm -hmm. right, where Dan Barry and myself visited every state in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, at least two and a half times. Okay. I stayed a week. And guess what I did? I shot that assignment with a panoramic uh, a Hasselblad with the SWC Hasselblad, but I carry those books. And people would write whatever they wanted, right? That we had interview, and then after the interviews, cool. after the interviews, I would ask them to write. We ended up with the, uh, one of the characters from The Wizard of Oz, the coroner. They found him in a senior center. He just passed away a few years back. You know, J Jeffrey Dahmer's confessor. I mean, you name it. We found it. We even found Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get back to it after the break. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Single Trick by Single Shot. Today I will tell you how to take a macro image without having macro lens with you. What you need to do is to focus your lens to as close distance as you can, then take it off the camera, holding it with your hands, determine how far it has to be from a camera in order to take a shot on a distance you'd like. Then you'll take my favorite piece of photo equipment, piece of paper, and make out of it a stripe that will be as wide as the distance you found for lens and a camera. Then connected with something. I'm connecting it with a staple, but can be really anything. This piece of paper is needed to minimize the light leaks. So once you've done it, you put it in front of the camera and take in your shot. Watch us on YouTube for more single tricks. talking about uh, traveling with uh, Hasselblad and the storybook uh, throughout the whole United States. And that was fun. And, you know, I ended up with, I think, uh, seven books that are sitting in seven books. On, there on, in my, on my shelf. So it's a separate uh, series in a way. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the uh, negatives are in a warehouse at the New York Times, but I have all my Polaroids and all that other stuff. Dan Barry just did a book. Uh, on the Disland column, little book, um, and um, so if you're interested in reading some of those stories, Dan Barry uh, um, wrote stuff. Um, but um, that was very interesting because I've never worked with, you know, I mean, when I was in art school, Ralph Hattersley uh, taught us how to use the view camera and how to light things with tungsten, or really how to sweat. <laughs> 
But, you know, when you're doing the kind of work that I was doing, uh, you needed these little guys, uh, get into places, work tight, and you had to run because people would be shooting or <laughs> riots had been breaking out. So you couldn't stand there with that uh, 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 Hasselblad. Uh, it, you have to crank it. Uh, for me, it, being dyslexic, sometimes <laughs> you know I, I can't play video games because I hit the wrong finger. We're <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, really, uh, running out of time uh, with no, our sorry. program, and hopefully we will meet again and continue this conversation. But there was one thing I wanted to ask you. Since uh, you was working on assignment given to you by other people for most of your life as a photojournalist, right. and now you're actually working for yourself. What would you say is the biggest difference and the way it feels? Oh, I don't have to do the who, what, when, where, and why. I just have to do the picture that I think tells all that in one, you know, without having to create other uh, situations or to move a story along. You know, there's, you know, there's all these visual elements of storytelling. Right, which changes when you don't have that concern, you know, uh, of trying to make a standalone image that works with other standalone images, uh -huh. you know. So, and again, that's where that whole rhythmic thing comes in, exactly. you know. How do these things work? How do that? And that's why I do these little. Instead of formalized ballet, you actually can do an affectionate dance now. Yes, you know, and I have brand new knees. I can really do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. You know. But, you know, it's, uh, uh, but a lot of times I came up with the ideas. With the Disland column, I heard about it and I ran in there and said, this is how it should be done. This is excellent. You know, panoramic and a square picture. All right, and I submitted a portfolio. As a staff photographer, I had a book in there with all, because I've been doing it. And, you know, and, I didn't hear anything. One day, they tapped me in the shoulder and go, Jan. Right. Well, somebody stole my portfolio case at the paper and gave me my prints back. <laughs> I can say that I don't understand that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Uncle. It's my it pleasure. It was really great was conversation. Fast. It went fast indeed. And yeah. hopefully we will uh, continue it again. found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark Unger for Roundtable. Thanks for watching.